I'm Gia Kokotakis with an episode from the Lawfare Archive for July 29, 2023. This week, Lawfare coverage discussed a California judge's decision to vacate a Biden administration policy that limits eligibility for asylum seekers. The judge found that the policy conflicted with the Immigration and Nationality Act's asylum provision. For today's archive episode, I picked an episode from December 7, 2020, in which Jack Goldsmith sat down with Adam Cox and Christina Rodriguez to discuss the President and Immigration Law, their book about the rise and operation of a president-dominated immigration system. They covered the ways Congress has delegated expanded power over immigration to the president, the role of de facto delegation in presidential enforcement discretion, and the benefits, costs, and legal limits of the system. I'm Jack Goldsmith, and this is the Lawfare Podcast, December 7th, 2020. I spoke with Adam Cox and Christina Rodriguez, who are the authors of the new book, The President and Immigration Law, which is about the historical rise and operation of a president-dominated immigration system. We discussed the various ways that Congress has delegated extraordinary power over immigration to the president, how what the authors call de facto delegation confers massive presidential enforcement discretion that is the basis for programs like the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program, and the benefits and costs and legal limits of this system. We also discussed what President Donald Trump accomplished with his immigration program during his term in office and President-elect Biden's possible immigration agenda. It's the Lawfare Podcast, December 7th. Adam Cox and Christina Rodriguez on the President and Immigration Law. So your book is called The President and Immigration Law, and it's in some sense, it's a, it's a rich book about many different things, but in some sense, as the title suggests, it's about these perhaps surprising dominance that the president, as opposed to Congress, has played in determining immigration policy really from the beginning of the nation but especially in recent decades. So can you start off by just sketching the, the claim and, and the history there? Sure. And Jack, thank you so much for having us on the podcast today. You're absolutely right. That's the core claim in our book. And of course, nearly everyone who reads a newspaper today is, is familiar with claims of presidential dominance or even usurpation of Congress's authority in the immigration space. That stuff has been front page news during both the Obama administration and the Trump administration. And that has led you know, many to be tempted to think that the story of presidential dominance is a story about our modern polarized politics. So it's a very recent story, or maybe even a, a story about the Trump administration in particular. And the goal of our book was really to encourage people to resist that temptation uh, because we think the roots of the president's power go much, much deeper. And we think understanding the history uh, that put the president in the driver's seat with respect to American immigration policy is uh, really important to charting a productive path forward. And so that, you know, that sort of untold story, which forms the first half of the book, is, of course, a story that dates back to the founding. You know, since the earliest days, presidents played a big role shaping American immigration policy in the, in the 19th century, you know, migration policy was quite literally made through treaties negotiated by presidents. But when Congress began adopting immigration laws in the late part of the 19th century, and over time built up an incredibly complicated code, it became tempting to think that that code really described the regulation of immigration. But we think that three interlocking changes that took place during the 20th century uh, instead, transferred an enormous amount of authority to the president. So let me just say quickly what the three are. We can obviously talk about them in more, more detail. The first was the rise of deportation as a regulatory tool. So it's almost unfathomable to us today, but when American immigration policy first got started, uh, there, there wasn't really an idea that deportation would be a, a serious part of the regulatory system. Early statutes lacked deportation power altogether. Um, and there was very little deportation in practice. Today, you know, the government deports enormous numbers of people every year. The statutory grounds of deportability are incredibly broad. 
So that, that first change in the structure of law, which made immigration more probationary, right? Put everyone under threat of being asked to leave, was accompanied during the 20th century's um, trajectory by explosive growth in an enforcement bureaucracy that could back those legal commands. So we went from a world where there was, you know, just a little bit of port of entry screening of immigrants, uh, basically no land uh, border enforcement. There's no border patrol before 1924 to a world today where the Department of Homeland Security has, you know, a budget that's bigger than all other law enforcement agencies at the federal level combined. And that during the Obama administration was capable of deporting 400,000 people a year and more people that are incarcerated in the entire federal criminal justice system. So the legal change and that bureaucratic development then collided in the latter part of the 20th century with rapidly rising rates of unauthorized immigration. And the causes of unauthorized immigration's rise are complicated and contested, but the consequences of that development are crystal clear. It left us with a world where uh, roughly 11 million non-citizens living in the United States are living here in violation of law. That's nearly half of all non-citizens living in the United States. And, and that gives us effectively an enormous shadow immigration system that kind of stands alongside the formal system. And in that world, the complex code becomes less significant. And what really matters are the enforcement choices made by executive branch officials about whom to deport and when. And that puts the president front and center because the president sits atop that enforcement apparatus and supervises it. Okay, let me ask you some follow-up questions about that. That's, that was a great sketch. So as I understand the system you were describing at the end, I think you described two types of delegation by Congress to the president in immigration law. And I just want to make sure I have this right so you can fix this if I mess it up. But one is what I think of as traditional express, very broad delegation to the president for certain immigration matters of the, the type of statute that was at issue in Hawaii versus Trump about exclusion, I think. So there's that type of delegation. And then there's what you call de facto delegation, complemented by what you were just describing as presidential enforcement discretion. And that is really about as you said, there's so many unauthorized aliens in the United States, and there's so many powers and authorities to the president that really, in effect, that Congress has, in effect, given discretion to the president to decide what the policy is. Is that a, is that a fair distinction? That is a fair distinction. And, and we talk about both types of delegation throughout the book. With, with respect to the first sort, the express delegation, uh, you're right that the Section 212F of the INA, the power that Trump relied on for the so-called travel ban or, or Muslim ban, is the most sweeping example of that. And it's one that he's used to almost swallow the code in a variety of ways. The other type of express delegation that we think is important to the story is of interstitial bureaucratic devices. And we uh, recount various instances throughout history, particularly with respect to the rise of American refugee policy, where various presidents have used these bureaucratic tools that were meant for small, narrow, discrete cases to actually open up large channels of immigration. And there's some talk about how to use those same bureaucratic devices to do something similar to what uh, DACA would accomplish. And, and, and we can certainly get in, into those details. But the de facto delegation idea, which is what arises from the, the system that Adam just described and that we spend two or three chapters in the book laying out is implicit. And it's, it arises not from a snippet of text, but instead from the structure of the law and the way in which the law has interacted in practice and how Congress has, in a sense, acquiesced in that system and acknowledged its existence, both explicitly in the way that members of Congress talk about immigration, but also in its understanding that the executive is going to make enforcement choices. And the, the, the significance of those enforcement choices is that it's the president who gets to pick and choose within the shadow system who will stay and who will go and is exercising the authority that you might think belongs to the legislature or that typically belongs in uh, the de jure system to the legislature set out in the code. And, and that's why it's something of a radical idea, because uh, we're arguing that 
Congress actually and sometimes has intended for the executive to be making these fundamental choices. And that's what enforcement policy consists of. Okay, great. Now, to make this concrete, I mean, the, the famous examples of this, what you're talking about, are the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, DACA, and the Deferred Action for Parents of Americans and Lawful Permanent Residents, DAPA. Is that right? Are those the two programs that are kind of paradigmatic examples of this? They are. I guess I would add a third cutting in the other direction, which is the Secure Communities Program. So focus not on, you know, not as a first order matter on protecting people from deportation, but on deciding whom to deport. And I think it's just a repeat with this, this goal of presidential supervision of these enforcement choices. And the thing that I would also add to that, Jack, is to emphasize the precursor policies to DACA and DAPA, which predate the Obama administration, at least since the Ford administration, the bureaucracy, or I should say high-level officials, uh, have tried to articulate enforcement priorities and through guidances to enforcement officials, shape the direction of enforcement. Uh, what was innovative about DACA and, and DAPA was that it enshrined those choices in a set of quasi rules that were much more right. binding right. on bureaucrats. Right. But, and that, and those quasi rules binding on bureaucrats are what, so some made it seem like less like enforcement discretion and more like rulemaking, I think. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, so let's just start off. Let's just talk about this de facto delegation. So the first thing is one part of the book, you talk about it being, there are two ways to look at this. You can see this de facto delegation as basically just a policy failure that there are, I think Adam said, 11 million unauthorized aliens in the United States. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah. So and you can just see the fact that the president and, and basically the way of thinking of this, the way I understood it from the book is there are so many unauthorized aliens in the United States. There's no possibility that the immigration laws could be fully enforced to deal with with those numbers one way or the other. And therefore, the presence of that many people and the many different legal tools the president has been given essentially is a delegation for the president to decide to basically determine immigration law by setting enforcement priorities. So one way of looking at that is that it's just a result of policy failure and was kind of unintended. The other way of looking at it, and Christina just suggested this, it is actually in some sense purposeful on Congress's part. And you had an interesting explanation about how it might be purposeful that many in Congress really understand what's going on here. There's a little bit of nodding and winking and the like. But could you, could you just, just flesh out the idea that this is actually an intentional system? In saying that it's an intentional system, we're very careful to say that there wasn't a moment when people got together and designed the system and thought, we need, for example, a large exploitable labor force, and uh, we can't get the legal authorities or the, the levels of visas through the, the Congress as a whole. So we're going to uh, just allow illegal immigration to thrive and authorize the president implicitly to make choices about who gets to stay primarily as a worker or maybe as, as a family member. So it's not that level of intention. It's instead, uh, as you suggested, a phenomenon that over time members of Congress uh, have become aware of and work with. And some of that has to do with the, the challenges associated with getting reform through the legislative process. But some of it also has to do with recognition that there's always going to be some slack or that it's, it's predictable that there might be some slack and that it's valuable to have a well-funded executive branch that makes decisions of this kind. And you don't need a shadow system as large as the one that, that we have to see this idea at work because the, the interest in allowing some executive official who's managing the system as it evolves to exercise humanitarian grace or to make choices about economic needs and the, the needs of families or other groups or interests that might be informing judgment will arise even without the shadow system of the extent that we've described. But the persistence of these tendencies to, to let the, the system stay in, in place has magnified the president's power and just reinforced the idea that this is the system that the branches have come to, to settle on as the, um, the way of, of managing the dynamics that Adam described at the outset. So 
here's a, here's one reaction to this. So it sounds like one can view this system as a kind of standardless delegation in the in the round, in in the aggregate, a kind of standardless delegation to the president to decide what to do with those 11 million people. But first of all, is that a standardless? Maybe too strong. Tell me why. Is that too strong of a of a description of what's going on here? That's a great that's a great way of putting the question. I, I guess let me draw two distinctions if I can, without resisting the question. One is that I, I think that describing this as a purposeful delegation and then characterizing the delegation as a kind of standardless one really does kind of bring to the front of your mind and kind of emphasizes the idea of a before the fact agreement on you know, what things are gonna look like. And I do think what we have in mind more or what we think the history bears out is more like a, a common law like story, you know, where, as Christine emphasized, at any particular moment in time, it wasn't necessarily some, you know, deliberate choice of Congress to give the president this or that power under this or that constraint. But as things developed, there was, you know, a, a sufficiently large set of political elites acting within the system who accepted the developments within certain constraints. And I guess in that sense, you know, our view is that not so much that it's standardless, but that we see the contestation over the, the kind of boundaries of that power playing out in the political arena. You know, and so our claims about the equilibrium we're in, you know, an equilibrium where in DACA, the president can stand in the Rose Garden and say, the reason why we're doing this is not because we lack the money to arrest all the dreamers and deport them. It's because they deserve to be here. Like that claim was kind of on board, not off board, right? It was within the realm of the politically plausible to claim a kind of membership for the dreamers. We think precisely because there's an acceptance at some level that the system is defining you know, a large number of people to be formally in violation of law about whom, you know, in the political arena, um, many believe don't deserve to be deported. And that's the normative sense in which, you know, our argument is that there's an acceptance of this de facto delegation. And if I could add to what Adam just said, your use of the word standardless, Jack, I think picks up on what critics of DACA are after, which is that this is a, a power that has no limits, or it's a power that's not guided by uh, the kinds of rules or principles that the exercise of executive power ought to be from statute. And that has led to a tendency to try to look for standards to limit the scope of deferred action. And one of the things that we do in the book or argue in the book is that a search for those kinds of standards in the Immigration and Nationality Act in the code is, is going to be fruitless, precisely for the reasons that Adam just gave. And I really like the way that he put it. It's that the boundaries are playing out in the political arena, and it's something that evolves as our understanding of the social meaning of unauthorized immigration and of a variety of related logistical and pragmatic concerns changes. Okay, I didn't mean so that those are great answers. I didn't mean my standardless delegation point to be quite as skeptical as as I think it came out of my mouth. I do have some questions about it though, but but that's one one way of looking at it is it's not a traditional delegation in the sense of even providing guidance about this policy versus that policy. It just leaves so much discretion to the president via his enforcement power, which is admittedly very broad. Before I get to some some skeptical questions, you do two things about with this in the book. You you explain where this de facto delegation came from. You do a great job of explaining its history and how it evolved. And and then you have a normative defense of it. And I think it's worth laying out to some people. Some people are going to be skeptical that you know there's the old-fashioned view that Congress should make the law, the president should enforce the law. This seems as you have the Justice Kennedy quote from, I think, U.S. versus Texas, I think. You, you have that quote from Justice Kennedy where he says this kind of flips our understanding of separation of powers. And you have a powerful response to that. Uh, so maybe you can explain what Justice Kennedy said at oral argument and then give your rejoinder. Justice Kennedy's 
mischaracterization of the government, the Obama administration's argument in favor of DACA at oral argument was that it had gotten government upside down, uh, that it was the executive making the rules instead of Congress making the rules. And we think that's misguided for a number of reasons. Uh, some of the reasons emanate from the kind of de facto delegation that we've just given, which is that this is the system that we have and part of managing the system uh, requires there to be direction given by high level political officials, which is what happened in DACA about the, the choices that have to be made in order to enforce the law. And to say that constitutional law requires that line level officials uh, without direction from above get to determine enforcement choices is inconsistent with the right concept of the system. If you if you don't accept our view of a de facto delegation and the way in which it assumes these choices will be made by the executive, then you have more room to disagree with what follows from that. But but that's the basic claim. Our normative defense of that system is premised on the idea that the the branches have complementary functions and strengths and that if you have uh, a functional system relying on the executive branch through a combination of what you learn from bureaucratic judgment and uh, on the ground decision making and the the political and systemic reflections of higher level officials is valuable in determining the the meets and bounds of the law and that it's actually useful to change its reach depending on what you learn by the operation of the law in practice. Uh, it's a kind of learning and making better by doing that makes the way that the executive plays this role in the, in the de facto system, one that actually reinforces separation of powers and doesn't undermine separation of powers. Okay, so, but what is the implication though for the uh, of this for the Trump administration? Trump tried to reverse DACA as he did with many of his efforts to wield executive power, he kind of blew it. But does it follow from your vision that, in fact, it might even follow from your democracy defense for this form of delegation, that the president gets to decide and a president who is hostile to immigration and who has the views that Trump has, has you know basically the same tools to be used in the opposite direction. Is that is that an implication of your argument? I think that very much is an implication of the argument. And with respect to Trump administration policies, for example, it meant that, you know, our view in the, in the Hawaii v. Trump litigation was that the, the statute did delegate to the president sufficient authority to erect significant travel bans in the way that he has. You know, we thought the policy was unlawful, but we thought it was unlawful because it amounted to unconstitutional discrimination on the basis of religious beliefs. So with respect to express delegations, you know, our view is the history has borne out the way in which they are really, truly sweeping. And in fact, the way in which when Congress has tried to constrain those expressly delegated powers, as Congress has tried to do on, on a number of occasions with respect to the parole power, its efforts have been pretty ineffectual. You know, the one uh, policy that does stand out really in the Trump administration, um, there are a number of policies that have been enjoined, though many of those injunctions didn't really stop the administration from accomplishing its goals through other ends with respect to like, say, asylum policy, which has been largely shut down. The one, you know, prominent counterexample really is DACA, where the Supreme Court, you know, put the brakes on the administration's efforts to rescind the program. And we think what that shows is in a way, maybe the the kind of role politics can, can play in constraining the president's power um, almost more so than law, because the Supreme Court's decision did not say that the administration lacked the power to rescind DACA. The reason why the administration's you know, efforts to rescind DACA failed was because the administration, you know, we think for, probably for political reasons, wanted to say that its hands were tied and that the reason it was unwinding DACA was that DACA was unlawful from the start. And the Supreme Court's decision to tell the administration effectively to do over their decision making rested on the idea that the administration had an obligation to explain its policy rationales for rescinding the program. So, you know, that's consistent with the idea that the president, as a legal matter, really, really does have 
the sweeping authority, even to undo programs like DACA. I also want to add, Jack, that we should be clear that our argument is not that the law does not constrain the president and that there's no law to constrain in immigration law. There's, of course, an elaborate code that constrains the, the president's actions, um, including and especially outside of the domain of enforcement, outside of the domain of de facto delegation. A lot of the litigation challenges to the Trump administration policies are of this procedural variety that Adam's describing. Though I think when the, the story is told of court's efforts to restrain, it's not going to be just about what the APA has required, but about the kinds of politics that, that Adam was invoking. And I would not have predicted that it would be this hard for the Trump administration to unwind a discretionary program. But there are other areas in the shutdown of asylum law, for example, where statutory law really does constrain the president's authority and where there is a strong claim that the administration has violated the limits of statutes. COVID has abended a lot of this because the president's been able to invoke emergency type powers to accomplish what seemed illegal under the, the INA. And, and those orders, of course, will either be mooted by the new administration or will continue to be challenged. Um, and we'll see if, if there are limits to those emergency thor- authorities as well. But it's important that we understand that it's not that law has not and cannot constrain the president. It's that we have to understand how and why, not that that there's an inherent authority here or untrammeled authority. Right. So that's a very fair point. But with regard to DACA itself, and that's a hugely important policy. And I think, I mean, I agree with Adam that the import of the Supreme Court's decision was not that the president lacked the power to rescind it, but that he just flubbed it the way he did it. The administration just flubbed it. So that just raises the question, I don't know if this is an implication of your argument or a limitation on the argument, but it does... And again, it's, it's, your argument is an argument that's in large part descriptive, just explaining where we are. But this conception of immigration law, this presidential conception of immigration law really does mean that, as is the case in lots of other foreign relations law areas, frankly, mean with, you know, with Congress has been cut out. I mean, you don't want to say Congress has been cut out, but Congress has been diminished in its importance in all sorts of foreign relations areas like international agreements and the like. One consequence there is you have sharp changes in policy is with, with changes of presidents. Think about the Iran deal and the Paris Agreement, which were done by President Obama through lawful but, but pretty imaginative mechanisms, but that made them fragile when Trump came in. And the same thing is true of a presidential-focused immigration policy. I guess that's just a consequence of this of this system, right? That's correct. I like the the characterization lawful but imaginative. Uh, that's a good way of describing what we think about DACA. Uh, and there is this sense in which uh, we're just moving back from one extreme to another. And I imagine that you will see lots of things unwound and in, in the next few years. And And one of the arguments that we make in the book towards the end, where we actually offer our vision for the system and make an argument that this shadow system is something that has to be brought to an end is to say that it's unstable and that the instability does come at a price. And it's hard to know, it's hard to know where uh, to set the equilibrium because it is important to be able to undo the policies of your predecessor when a new regime comes into place. And that new regime reflects a new political reality, and also an opportunity for for groups and interests that have been shut out previously. But at at a certain point, the back and forth becomes exhausting, and the reach for some kind of lasting change is attractive. The problem, of course, is that lasting change requires a greater political consensus than emerges from a single presidential election which makes the the lasting structural reform elusive and just keeps us in this back and forth. But just to be clear, that's that's very helpful. But just to be clear, you're not in, in, in writing a long and great book about the president and immigration law. There's nothing in your argument that's against some consensus on these policies that could be implemented by Congress, right? No, not at all. And in fact, I think, you know, our our core normative argument is a kind of argument from second best. We think the most important defense of de facto delegation is that 
in a world where we've got you know half the legal subjects in this arena in violation of law, it's a it's a false choice to think that we're choosing between the president exercising power to decide what to do and Congress. Instead, the real choice is whether it's going to be the president and other politically accountable officials uh, exercising authority to decide what to do, or instead, you know, line level enforcement agents making those decisions. So we think in that world that we live in, it seems pretty clear to us that (laughs) politically accountable uh, supervision is preferable to the alternative. But, you know, our argument does not suggest that moving towards a different world, if you get enough agreement, on some of these central issues where you shrunk the arena of de facto delegation, right? By, by shrinking or eliminating the shadow state, uh, that, could be, that, that could be a better world for immigration. Uh, and our argument does not rule that out. Okay, great. I want to shift topics a little bit. Uh, among the many things I didn't know much about and learned about in this book was about the parole power and how important it's been, especially in 20th century American immigration law. And how presidents have exercised it really sort of in defiance of congressional efforts to curtail it. Why don't you, just, if you could just start off by just explaining to the listeners what the parole power is, how it kind of grew in importance, and, and what it's, how it fits into immigration law today. So the parole power is a device that's been in the immigration code since 1952, and it was adopted around the same time or in the same legislative moment as the suspension power, the 212F power, the Trump v. Hawaii power. But it's very different on its face. It is a device that's meant to allow the executive branch to parole someone into the United States, that is, someone who has not otherwise been admitted under the standards of the law, for a discreet Uh, usually an urgent purpose. They need to be a witness in a case or they need medical care or something of that sort. And it was understood to be a a case-by-case interstitial device, but it's something that presidents very early on seized on as a way of actually admitting tens of thousands of refugees from various parts of the world. And it was, I believe President Eisenhower was the first to use it in this fashion uh, because the laws enacted by Congress were not adequate to accommodate the the refugees from Hungary after the Soviet crackdown in the 1950s. And there were countries all over the world who were accepting refugees from Hungary, but not a means by which they could enter the United States. So Eisenhower uses this power, which is supposed to be a case-by-case power, to actually allow thousands of people into the country. And then that's the same power that was used to admit Cubans after the, the Cuban Revolution and, and Castro's Takeover. It was the same power that's been used to admit Vietnamese refugees and and even Asian and Cuban refugees in the 1990s to to one extent or, or the other. And as Adam alluded to before, each time there has been an episode of this kind, there's been debate in Congress about whether that was an abuse of the the power that was granted because it was not meant to be categorical. It was not meant to invent a refugee system. And Congress sometimes has complained, but not done anything about it. In other instances, tried to tighten the parole power, make it clear in the code that it is a limited device. And yet, not only do presidents keep using it, but often the people who are paroled, and it's a discretionary status, it's not a formal legal status, those people are later given status by Congress because the political pressure to do so uh, is strong enough, and those people develop entrenched interests in the United States. And so it's a really interesting way of seeing how a bureaucratic tools can actually be used to transform a system when there is the political will to do it, or there is some external event or series of events that puts pressure on the government to act and the executive branch looks for the tools that it has to act. And it was a great example in the book of how, of many, about how presidents have used these tools to kind of assert dominance in this area. You said at one point that Obama, if you could explain this, it would be great if that Obama could have used the parole power to go even further and give more comfort to the people protected by DACA and chose not to. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Could you just explain what more he could have done, how parole would have given greater protection than DACA did, why he didn't do it? it it's, it's an interesting story. Sure. So as Christina described parole, it was conceived of as a vehicle to allow the president to permit non-citizens 
to enter the country who are essentially standing at our gates, you know, but in need in some way. But because of some congressional changes to immigration law in the mid 1990s, the statutory basis for the exercise of parole can actually be used with respect to people who are physically present in the United States, but have not been admitted. That exercise is known as parole in place. It's been wielded by both Democratic and Republican administrations. And the reason it's important is this. There are, by most estimates, something like maybe a million people, unauthorized immigrants, who entered our country without inspection um, and are actually eligible for green cards. So they've sensed their entry married an American citizen, and on that basis are, are eligible for a green card, but they can't get the green card because other provisions of immigration law say that if they leave the country to go to a consulate and pick up their green card, they'll be barred from re-entry because of their old immigration violation. And if they stay in the United States, they can't get the green card because you can't get new immigration papers in the country unless you've been inspected and admitted previously or paroled. And so it's that language <laughs> in this technical procedure for getting new immigration papers that makes the parole power so important. If President Obama had paroled in place a large number of, say, all, all unauthorized immigrants who were married to American citizens, which might have been like a million people, it would have immediately made those folks eligible, not just for protection against deportation, but for green cards. So in a way, it would have been a more sweeping and more permanent form of protection for people than DACA provided. Because as you noted, DACA you know, can be rescinded. It's a discretionary form of um, enforcement forbearance. Now, the Obama administration chose not to go that route. We can only speculate about why they made that choice. And we can wonder whether the Biden administration will make the same choice. Obviously, the upside for an administration is you get a more durable uh, form of relief, one that cannot be easily undone by the next administration. Uh, politically, the downside is that it puts the president in the position, although he's exercising authorities that are clearly delegated by the immigration code, you can see the way in which a policy might be characterized as the president handing out green cards. And it might be that the feared backlash to that political characterization of such a policy was what you know led the Obama administration to try more limited steps initially. Okay, so you mentioned what the Biden administration might do. So I'm a casual follower of immigration law and policy, not an expert like y'all. And I, I don't really have a great sense of what Trump accomplished. I mean, he was obviously hostile to, to immigration across the board, but I don't have a, given all the litigation and, and the various types of maneuvers he made, I don't understand. Could one of you just give us an overview of what Trump accomplished, what he failed to do in, in, in kind of a 40,000 foot way and where things stand at the dawn of the Biden administration? So Trump accomplished a, a breathtaking amount, and I should say it wasn't you know him per se, but the people installed who had immigration as a high priority. And I, I think one of the main lessons of the Trump administration is that it takes political will to transform the bureaucracy. So it was a combination of intense political will by people such as Jeff Sessions and those in charge of Homeland Security, Stephen Miller and others combined with an understanding of how to exploit as many bureaucratic tools as possible and having people at high levels who could supervise that process. So it's, it's difficult to canvas everything that the administration has done. It's certainly true that a lot is mired in litigation. And the most visible of that is, of course, DACA and the failure of the administration to rescind it. And I don't think it will succeed before the clock runs out. But there are many other ways in which the administration has transformed the, the system. So it has had an, an enormous impact on the immigration courts by doing a variety of things like certifying decisions by immigration judges and the appellate body within DOJ to the attorney general 
to issue opinions about the meaning of asylum law. The AG has authority under the Homeland Security Act to say what the law means and has dramatically narrowed the government's understanding of asylum law. It has issued similar opinions and promulgated regulations to limit the ability of immigration judges to close their cases and to manage their dockets in the interest of promoting faster deportation. It has issued enforcement priorities at high levels in the Department of Homeland Security that are really not priorities at all, but a statement that all forms of deportation will be pursued. It has chosen to do things like use its maximum authority under the code to apply uh, this procedure called expedited removal, which allows uh, the removal of people without process if they've been in the United States for less than two years. And it goes on and on. Um, some of the things that are not visible are ways in which the Trump administration has slowed down the legal immigration system. This is something that when we first started writing, uh, we didn't really identify as a significant threat or possibility. But the Trump administration has been able to slow down uh, legal immigration by slowing down processing, by changing lots of rules that govern the way that legal visas are issued, by doing things, for example, like requiring that every every field in a form be filled out in order to be accepted. If you don't fill out the name of your brother, even if you don't have a brother, your form gets rejected. And so that has made processing times longer, wait times longer, and the actual numbers of legal immigrants have plummeted as the result of some of these measures. And of course, there's the whole suite of executive orders and other kinds of orders related to COVID that have shut asylum down at the border and uh, otherwise stopped legal streams of immigration. And so despite all the litigation, and some of these things that I've mentioned are in litigation, the Trump administration has accomplished a great deal. So last question, just give us, if you could, a similar overview of you know, what, what the Biden administration's announced plans are and what its prospects are. I mean, is, it, is the aim here to go back to the status quo ante of January 19th of 2017? Is there a different plan? I mean, what, what has Biden said about what he plans to do with Trump's immigration policy and what are the prospects for achieving it? So thus far, not a lot of details have been released, although obviously, you know, it's been widely reported that Biden as a candidate talked about m moving forward with some form of a large scale uh, legalization program so that many of the public statements during the latter days of the campaign really centered on things that would have required Congress to get involved. And, you know, all of that hinges on the Senate election in Georgia, probably. So we don't we don't know whether those possibilities can come to pass if we focus you know, where our book has been, which is on executive uh, branch action, Christina's laundry list of all the things the Trump administration uh, has done, obviously, you know, provides, as you say, a kind of laundry list for correctives. You could imagine trying to reverse a lot of those actions. And some of it is quite low hanging fruit, you know, rescinding many of the executive orders that established travel bans of various sorts, for example, would be a relatively straightforward uh, way to revert back to the status quo. I guess if I had to pick, you know, three areas where I could imagine there being a lot of attention um, in the coming month, I think one is going to be on restarting our asylum system, because that is one area where through a series of overlapping moves that the Trump administration really did quite effectively entirely shut down the system for screening asylum applicants along the southern border, like, even as they confronted a whole number of losses in court, uh, they still, the administration still managed to get enough policies in place that there are essentially no grants of asylum um, happening along the southern border now. So I think restarting that system is going to be a real focus for the, uh, the Biden administration. Related to that and to the pandemic and to larger uh, moves within the the criminal justice reform arena in part, I think that immigration detention is another area that is likely to, to become a focus and, and a place where the Biden administration could make a difference in short order. Because even during the pandemic, we've seen the, the populations of at least a small number of detention facilities reduced dramatically. And there's some evidence from small scale programs that other forms of supervision can ensure the appearance of non-citizens at their hearings at equally high rates and at much lower cost to the government. And so that seems like a, a real potential opportunity for the administration. Third, 
you know, I think inevitably deciding what to do exactly about DACA and other forms of protection for unauthorized immigrants in a world where the Senate is not within the control of the Democratic Party and, and where a legislative legalization program is not on the table in the near term, that, that seems like it, it will also be an enormous focus. And there, I, I think the Biden administration will have to confront the thing we were just talking about, which is whether whether to attempt, especially in the face of the hints from the Supreme Court uh, in the DACA litigation about the legality of DACA's work authorization provisions, I think that might change the calculus in how the administration thinks about using something like the parole power as an effort to provide you know, more durable protection for at least people who can be protected through the use of that power. The note on which we end the book is to say that we should not just return to the status quo ante. There are obviously a lot of things that can and should be undone, but one of the ways in which the advent of the Trump administration affected us as writers and scholars uh, was to push us to, to think about the normative implications of the shadow system, not just to notice that it existed. And one of the effects of the Trump administration more generally, not just in immigration, but elsewhere, is to show us areas of the law or statutory authorities that are that are open for abuse. And what we argue at the end of the book first is that the, the shadow system is intolerable, that it's intolerable to have 11 million people who are subject to essentially the whims of the, the chief executive. And you alluded to the possibility of uh, future Trumps um, or people like him. And th that possibility is a reason to undo the shadow system and make for a more humane system as a whole. And second, it underscores the importance of identifying places in the law that uh, require a, a more broad ranging kind of change. So for example, legislation that put statutes of limitations back into deportation or that uses deportation less frequently, that provides easier paths to, to citizenship for people who are here, or um, legislation that makes it difficult to deport people on a rapid basis. The, the kinds of structural changes that we were discussing before that are difficult to find consensus to achieve, but that we think are, are necessary to have a just and humane regime. And so we shouldn't be satisfied if much of what Trump has done gets undone because the work would remain undone if that were the case. Okay, terrific. That's a that's an appropriate place to end. Thank you both very much and congratulations on such a great book. I learned a ton. Thank you so much, Jack. Thank you so much for inviting us to to speak with you. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperations with the Brookings Institution. Please share the Lawfare Podcast and give us a five-star review on iTunes. Go to thelawfarestore.com for brand new Lawfare pins, lanyards, t-shirts, and socks. The podcast is edited by Jen Patia Howell, and your audio engineer was Zachary Frank of Goat Rodeo. Our music is performed by Sophia Yan. As always, thank you for listening.